I will do first some advertisement, and this is to encourage you people to go back to your countries or to establish collaborations after you leave ICGV, because it's not only the mandate, but this is the way to contribute to science development in our countries. So this is what I did uh, on the first uh, period after the, the postdoc in the United States. I started to get in touch with the people in my country, and this is how I, when, when the time came and, I, and, and we decided to go back to Colombia, we had some opportunities to retribute what it has, given, has been given to us. So I was very lucky as well because when I was here, I was working with rice-associated bacteria. And we were then studying the, the plant-bacteria uh, interactions in terms of the cell-cell communication. And when I went back home, there was this project to work as well with rice-associated bacteria. So it was very nice. So first I'm going to do as well more advertisement and it's talking about the place that I'm working. So I am a postdoc from a company that works in the university. And how is this? Because this is a, a spin-off company. So a company that works uh, in association with in close collaboration with the university. So the university performs research for them and they contribute giving royalties from the products that they develop. So it's a very good uh, uh, interaction, academia, industry, and it works because the, the terms of the communication are clear. So they are clear in what they can do. The company provides resources and provides as well a structure to, for example, design products, but the, the university provides the knowledge, the know-how. In this, the university is very good. So a National University of Colombia is where I did my bachelor and my master's. Uh, it's, not a, it's the biggest university in Colombia. We have uh, 45,000 students, so in eight campuses in different cities of Colombia, so it's not only in Bogota, we have campuses in, in several cities. Um, we have 3,500 teachers, and as well, uh, starting teachers, uh, TAs, 54 PhD programs, and all these 150 master's programs in all these, in all these campuses. Different uh, specializing courses that are short courses one year, and 38 medical science residence programs. So, it's a big university. In the campus in Bogota where I work, we have 20,000 people crossing the campus every day. So it's a big campus. It's a big city. Bogota is a nine million people city. So it's a big thing. So this is the company where in, in which I, I work now. This is a Biocultivos. It's a company that is uh, junk. It's 12 years old. I was there when they started the first contact uh, with, the, with the university. So this started because a group of farmers, and farmers that have a lot of land and a, and a lot of crops that are important, economically speaking, had heard about the, the, the power of the inoculants. And what are the inoculants? So these bioinoculants. So are products for, the, for improve the quality of a crop that are based either in bacteria or fungi. So, they heard from people that there were these products that could increase the nutrient availability and in this way promote the plant growth. And they heard that, for example, in, in, in sugar cane or in, or in rice, where you need a lot of phosphate, you need a lot of nitrogen, if you, if you provide a bacteria that increase the nutrient availability from those, those substances, they could get increases in yield. Increases that mean the 30, 40% increase in yield. If we're, we're talking that an hectare produces 100 tons of, of rice, if we talk about the 40%, it's a lot of money. So they saw they were very, very ambitious and they wanted to start something. So the knowledge were somewhere else. And then they decided we have to look for the bacteria in our own soils and try to generate a company, an organization intended to develop this product. So they got in touch with the National University and they started this, this company. And now today they have four products in two different formulations. So this is a big portfolio and they, they are able to produce seven to 200 uh, doses per month of different products. So the, we are talking about a plant in which they have four to thousand liter uh, fermenters in which they can produce everything that they, they program, they schedule to, to produce. These are the logos of some of the products, and they are available for you also in English if you need them. So now let's talk about rice. I always started my presentations when I was a PhD student talking always about rice. We know 
Rice is an economically important crop for the world. So in India, in Latin America, in, in, in Asia, we have a lot of rice. In Colombia, it's the third economically important crop. So we're talking that there is coffee, there are flowers, there are bananas, but rice is what people eat every single day. So we have this, this amount of production, almost 800,000 tons per year, and this is the cultivated area. And this is the map of Colombia. I'm sorry that the resolution is not the best, but all the colored areas are areas where we grow rice. And we grow rice in different ways, irrigated or inundated. And different varieties, cultivars of rice, have been developed for Colombian purposes. So we are talking that we need special rice for special conditions because we are in the tropic. So we need special cultivars that have been developed for Colombian purposes. Um, and then let's talk about the enemy. So there are several, many bacterial diseases and fungal diseases of rice. Many of those I got to know when I was in, in Vittorio's lab. Uh, one of these bugs is uh, Burcordilia grumae. It's a wonderful model to study pathogenicity because it regulates the, the virulence determinant expression in a quorum sensing manner. So I always say that this, this bug is just exciting in, 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 in way to study. And it develops this disease, it generates this disease called bacterial panicle blight. So these are the panicles of the rice, you know, those things from where their grains come out, those are the panicles. And this, this um, Burcordilia uh, is very special because you don't see the symptoms in the plant until the last stage of growth. So when I went back home, I, I never heard about Burcordilia in Colombia before 2007. In 2007, a strong outbreak of Burcoldiria appeared and they didn't know what it was. They were thinking that it was fungus, that, was, that they were different other pathogens because they never heard about Burcoldiria. And then they got in touch with the people from the US who were also facing an, an outbreak of Burcoldiria and they found out that this pathogen had arrived there. And how did it arrive? Well, because it's a seed-borne pathogen. So what we see, the symptoms are these. This is this slide, some of them are taken from the National Fund for Rice Development in Colombia, Fede Arroz. So these are the symptoms. We see panicle, panicles that are, when we, when we expect the rice, to, the rice grains to fill after the flowering, the third month of development, we expect the panicles to bend. So when you go, now I go to the fields all the time and I expect to see after four months all the panicles bending because they are full of, of rice, no? But if they don't bend after the fourth month, most likely they are infected with Burcoldiria glumae because Burcoldiria generates a sterility of the florets and then the grains won't feed. And this is a big issue. So we, we, we see that the rachis is green still but the, the, the grains start to become from yellow to gray, and sometimes we see these the signals we see here that they are getting rocky, and then they never bend. So they call it in Spanish baneamiento because it doesn't bend. So it's very sad because you only realize that after the fourth month. And so you, you think your, your crop is healthy and people is very happy, and then when you are going to harvest, you have nothing. So uh, in, in uh, America and here in Europe, the disease that is generated by Burcondilia gruma is known as bacterial panicle blight, but in Asia, there are some reports talking about bacterial grain rot. In, in fact, it's the same disease. So it's important because it's a seed-borne disease. So you might think, okay, if we control, if we check that the seeds are not polluted, then we won't have the disease. Well, it doesn't happen because no, now we know in Colombia, in the tropical weather, that infected seeds might not always generate disease. It is depending entirely on the weather. Since we are having a climate change, we, got, we are having a global warming, there are days when we have high humidity, high temperature, and low uh, light. If we have low radiation, then we will have Burcoldilia glumae if the seeds were polluted. We have the grain discoloration and infertility, so the grains won't fill in. We have a disease cycle that is poorly understand, uh, understood. What I mean with that is that people have studied very well which regulates the, the, 
virulence expression in Burkholderia glumae, but we don't know what is happening in the plant. So this plant side, in which moment we have expression of the virulence factors in different cultivars, is, has been kept or it hasn't been published. So it's difficult to preview what is going to happen in the, in the plant. So this interaction has to be much better understood. Um, as I said, this is why this, this was exciting to me in the first approach because I did my PhD thesis in quantum sensing, so I wanted something familiar. And all the chemical treatments have reported resistance, so I will, I will talk this, about this more later. So when I arrived to Colombia and I was told, you know, we were trying to develop something against Burkordilia gluma, I started checking the papers and then what I saw is that this is not a new problem. So people in Asia have reported before from early, from, from mid the, the, 19th, the 20th century, they reported the appearance of Burkholderia in Japan. And Japanese people, they have developed several strategies to control it. In Korea, it was a big problem, Sri Lanka. And in America, it, it showed um, an outbreak appeared in the mid 90s. And also now they are facing an, a strong outbreak in Louisiana in the south. In Central America, it was reported in Panama and then it appeared in Colombia. But the first report that appeared about the species as such, Pseudomonas glumae, Burkholderia glumae, was reported in SEAT, which is a, a tropical agriculture center in Colombia in 1987, even though we didn't have the disease as such. So I'm sorry about this slide. It's an official slide from the font of, uh, for, the, for the rice in Colombia. So this is the map. These are the places where we, it, the, the Burkholderia glumae was detected. And now we know, checking more about the strains that develop disease, that the first spot was here. It's a very hot place in the Caribbean. Um, and then it started spreading through this way and this way. And now it's very strong in this region that is flat. And it's a very dry uh, soil. So also it has to do with the humidity. And this is, this is a, a slide in which I show you in the green bars, we have the yields in production after the uh, every year, monitored every year, you know. And this, this slide what wants to show you is that we can, we can grow rice in two seasons in Colombia because we don't have the, the seasons as you know them. We can grow it two times. So we can seed in May and harvest in end of August, or we can seed on uh, November and harvest at the end of February. So when we grow, they, the people have noticed that when they grow it in, in December, in, in November, they don't get a high incidence of Burkholderia. When they seed in May, they will have most likely Burkholderia after the outbreak that was, not, that was detected here in 2007. So you see from people who were producing, for example, 6.5 to have 3.7, that's important. It's a lot of money they are losing. And there are people who are only dedicated to grow rice in Colombia. So if they have half of the production, they are losing a lot of money. So if we have studied so much Burkholderia, why is it getting so complicated to control this pathogen? Because it's, as I said before, it's a seed-borne disease, but polluted seeds not always cause disease. So there were people, some, some uh, trends saying what we have to do is simply do a PCR in the seeds and avoid the, the avoid the salt. I mean, avoid selling seeds that are polluted. But the truth is that the same batch that is polluted didn't generate disease last year and is generating disease this year. So we have a strong program in Colombia to monitor the weather, and we have noticed that in those places where the humidity has increased, is where the outbreak is coming. Now we know that there are chemical treatments. I mean, Japanese and Koreans are always reporting the use of oxolinic acid, but oxolinic acid generates emergence of resistance and plus it's toxic and it's not approved for the rice, for using rice in the FDA. So Colombia is now reviewing if they can use oxolinic acid, but it's not recommended for the toxicity that it can generate. As I said, there's a multifactorial pathogenesis associated to changes in these factors. And people is also proposing to use other antibiotics, but this is controversial because we don't want to add chemicals uh, that can generate changes in the microbiota of the soil. Copper has been proposed and is now under review, but it's very toxic. 
as I said, oxalinic acid, which is a quinolone, is not, uh, is not recommended in Colombia. It was used in Japan. And you know, these farmers, what they look for is something. They want a bottle that they can spread and it control the disease. We can get control in one year, but in two years, what are we doing if we get resistance? Because uh, these Burkholderi are able to generate mutations in GRA, and then they are resistant to oxalinic acid. And, and something strong in which we are working is to improve the crop practices. So if we handle the irrigation of the, of the rice crop, we have noticed that we have less incidence, lower incidence of Burkholderia also handling the nitrogen and the potassium. So we are working in different ways. I'm collaborating with, uh, through Biocultivos and the National University with epidemiology of Urcolderia gluma strains. I can talk to you if you're interested about this project, uh, which is very, very exciting. But right now, we want to develop a, a biocontrol product between a collaboration in the, in, in the, among the National University Biocultivos and this other university here. So we can, of course, study the enemy, so try to understand the spread to see if all the, all the Urcolderia glumae are the same, if they are clonal or they are epidemic, or if they, if they have different origins. And that could be important because maybe there is, there is a, some tropism between strains and several cultivars. We are not growing the same cultivar in all the place, so we can check that. We can check if there is association and in relation between the weather changes and in a specific clone of Urcolderia. We can check uh, the, the, term, the, the, the virulence uh, uh, determinants that are expressed among them, especially because in the United States it was reported the emergence of clones that are asymptomatic and are quorum sensing deficient. But, the, but we don't know if it, at any point they can express as well other virulence determinants that are not quorum sensing regulated. And this is currently under study in the United States. We are also working in the improving the diagnostic techniques because we know that if we can detect in an early point the, the, the presence of Burkholderia, we could do something. Or at least the person could decide, okay, I'm going to cut all this and I'm going to grow something else. No? And if we are talking about one hectare or two, it's okay. But we are talking about hundreds and thousands of hectares that one single person can have. So this, this definitely is something we are developing now. We have real-time PCR detection, and we have increased the sensitivity of the diagnostic system. This is something I'm working as well. And Feda Ross is working from the plant side, trying to develop new cultivars, which are tolerant. And there are 10 or 12 candidates now uh, under evaluation. And they seem to have some level of tolerance. But still, they have reductions in 10 20% in the yield of rice. So now I was told to go slowly and talk about biocontrol. I check before this presentation all the presentations that are there in iTunes, and I know that you people have heard before about biocontrol here recently, but we are going to review the topic in a different way. So I love this slide. It's something that Vittorio taught me long ago. This is the plant disease triangle. Now people is talking about the plant, plant disease tetraedron. So we know that to get disease, we have an interaction between the pathogen, the host, and the environment. Now we have evidence that also puts here the resident bacteria. So a pathogen arrives to a plant, and there is the environment that provides the conditions to generate disease. But the resident bacteria of that plant team up with the pathogen that is coming in, and then we have disease that can be more or less severe depending on those, on those residing bacteria. So now there is the appearance of the biological control. That is a concept that is not new. And this is a definition from Joyce Lopper, who says that the, the biological control is basically the reduction of the amount of an inoculum of a disease-producing activity bacteria or pathogen accomplished by the introduction of one or more microorganisms. So we can use fungus or we can use bacteria to try to reduce and control the emergence of expression of virus determinants or simply to control the disease. For example, we can think about a bacteria that can get to reduce the expression of virulence determinants. So my pathogen is there, but I don't see effects on the yield. It's okay, as long as the productivity keeps going on. So which are the desirable pro properties of a biocontrol agent? So what do we want? 
We want first a good strain of whatever. We want a strain that is highly effective, but it's, effect, it's, it's effective because it's able to compete and persist. We have to think that we are providing this strain to the soil or to the plant, and in the plant there are other bacteria, and there are conditions that are harsh, and so the bacteria has to persist and has to multiply and has to express all those um, antimicrobial compounds or all, all, all the conditions that is able to allow it control and has to prevail there. So it has to colonize and proliferate. So for example, there is a term now very much used in, 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 this, in this field that is that it has to be rhizosphere competent or it has to be endosphere competent. In this, in this case, competence means the ability to prevail in an environment. So if it's in the rhizosphere, it has to be able to colonize the rhizosphere and prevail there. If we're talking about the endosphere, it means that it's able to go inside and prevail there. And that's very exciting because if we think about a bacteria that can get in, into the plant and, for example, slowly deliver antimicrobial compounds, we have a powerful agent. And very important, it has to be non-pathogenic to host plant or to the environment. So all screenings for biocontrol strains have to be follow up by toxicity analysis as well. Ideally, we would look for a, a, a bacteria that is easier to grow in a fermenter. You know, if you look for biocontrol strains, you will find lots of studies there in pavement of people who are screening for strains and they arrive there. So they say it's good for biocontrol. But the studies where you actually grow the fungus or the bacteria and provide it to the field and follow up what is happening are quite scarce. And ideally, we would like to have a, a formulation that guarantees a, shell, a long shelf life. So if I'm going to produce this and I'm going to sell it, I want it to be stable at least for, for, for three months, three months onwards, because the, it takes a time from the moment I produce it and I sell it and the person applies it. So, I want it to, to be stable, and I want the formulation that allows the delivery of the compounds or the delivery of the bacteria to have the activity that I suppose it has. So developing a bioinoculant, these, these pictures are from my lab. I, I work in a group that is exper has a lot of experience in bioengineering, so they know how to ferment, they know how to grow bacteria, they know how to grow uh, fungus. So everything starts from having a good strain. So, we spent one, two, three years doing bioprospecting, looking for the strains that have the best activity. Then we, we do the first growing in the, in the lab. So we do in flask scale. So we want to know if it, is, if it grows fast, for example. Or, or even if it doesn't grow fast, but it produces a lot of the metabolites or the activity. Then we go in the 14 to 30 liter scale. So I was talking, I was in a meeting several days ago and there was a poster and the guy said, no, I scale it up. Okay, you scale it up to which volume? And the guy was saying, one liter. Okay, that's not scaling up. That's a flask scale, okay? If we are talking about a fermenter with all these cables and tubes, that's scaling up because the conditions for growing bacteria or fungi change dramatically when you change the volume. And you have to make sure that the aeration, that the, the nutrient supply is always there. If you have to do feedback or what do you do? And then we go to one liter, this is in my lab, one liter, uh, 1,000 liters uh, fermenters. And this is even much more complicated. And then what you care about is to apply this in the field and see the control or to see the effect that you want. So three years ago, before I came to Colombia, this group started to do some bioprospecting studies in order to look for strains with the ability to control Burkholderia and other pathogens of rice. So first, they were looking for Burkordilia glumae uh, antagonist, and they were also thinking about this other pathogen, which is very interesting, and Vittorio's lab is also working on it, that is Pseudomonas fuscovaginae. Because we have the idea that the, these two, when Burkordilia gets in, it helps Fusco to develop disease, and this is why it's getting complicated to control. We are not only facing one enemy, we are facing two that get together and generate disease. And we found these three guys here, uh, which have wonderful antimicrobial activity against Burkholderia, and some of them have against uh, uh, Pseudomonas fuscovaginae. 
We enrich for actinobacteria because actinomycetes are, the resp are responsible of the production of the 75% uh, of antibiotics that are there in the market. So we thought maybe if we enrich for actinobacteria, we can get strains that are uh, produce anti antimicrobial compounds. So at the beginning, what they, what they did was to use virulent strains that were provided by SEAT from Urcordilia gluma, Urcordilia gladiolae, that it generates similar symptoms to the bacterial panicle blight, Pseudomonas fuscovaginae, and Acidoborax albinae. And we saw that this isolate here was active against all of them. This was proved in many ways. Um, and these two were active against the Urcoldiria guys, but not against Fusco. So in this point is when I came home and they told me, let's try to do some studies in these three guys and try to find out if they are suitable to start a biocontrol, uh, a biocontrol agent production. So what we did. So you know, you're a postdoc and you want to impress your boss. You have a lot of ideas. So we tried to work in three in different ways. So first thing, I was very curious to know whom I was working with. So first thing was to do some taxonomy. And I did this with the help of the Vittorio's lab because I came here once and I sent a student here for two months. Then we did as well, uh, we studied the antimicrobial range. So what is this Micro antimicrobial spectrum? So it's, it's able to control Purcoldiria glumae, we know, but it may, it may be able to control other pathogens of rice. So a product can be more interesting if it has a broad spectrum. Then we try as well to identify the antimicrobial metabolites. And in this point, I have to, to stop and say, why is it important to know the antimicrobial compounds? What they care is that the, the, the bacteria is active in the soil when I apply it. It's good to know how it works or which is pro what compound is producing, because I can follow it up in the fermentation. And what we care is that we are having a lot of these metabolites or that we know when are they getting released from the bacteria. And we want to estimate, this is very important, which are the effects when I inoculate this bacteria in the plant. It might happen that the, the actinobacteria gets rid of endophytes and then the plant is not growing as it should. So we have to check all these four points in an initial stage. We decided to call this product BioActor. This, we made a consensus in the lab, which is the most, the sexiest name, you know, something that a farmer can remember quickly. So we thought BioActor could do. And we started doing some uh, morphology analysis on this actinobacteria. So first thing you see when you get a bacteria is the color and shape, the color. And this is very nice because this actinobacteria produce a lot of pigments and they, Actinobacteria, many of them uh, suffer a differentiation along the growth. So you first see the spores and then you see them growing and you see changing colors when you change from one media to the other. And this is the, pro the way to do the first phenotypical analysis when you try to do taxonomy. See the, the face of your colonies. Then we did some microscopy and this is A20. This is uh, my favorite strain. 5.1 and 7.1, this is inverted uh, microscopy. We see the chaining here, maybe it's not very clear, but the, the kind of chaining in the spore development is a, an important trait when you're doing taxonomy, but it was not enough. We did biochemical analysis, I, I'm not going to show that here today, but it was not leading us anywhere. It could be any kind of streptomyces or actinobacteria. So we did a molecular analysis. So first thing I did was a 16S analysis and this I'm here showing you a phylogenetic tree, neighbor joining tree based on 16S, that is a molecular marker, molecular uh, chronometer. And then we saw that they were all of them streptomyces. So this A20 is very closely related to streptomyces, uh, racemochromogenes and polychromogenes. And this 7.1 is uh, very close to this canarius, and in fact is yellow. And 5.1 is, it seems to be a new species, which is pretty related to this, um, this clade. Now, taxonomy in streptomyces is complicated because since streptomyces are, have been historically industrially interesting bacteria, everybody finds a strain, characterizes, and says, oh, it's different in the spore. So I'm going to say that it's a new species. And it's been 
years, there are six, 650 strains of species of Streptomyces, and they are very close in, in the 60s level. So you need many more things to be able to say that they are one species of the other. Because of that, we decided to, to do multi-local sequence typing, that it is to sequence genes that are important, uh, housekeeping genes that are molecular chronometers as well, and complement the 16S analysis. We have already done this for all the three strains. Uh, now I'm just allowed to tell you that uh, this uh, A20 is very close to racemochromogenes in all the markers. We got the type strains, we sequence the genes in the type strains, and we know now that this belongs to this species. So then, next step was to confirm the results from the first screening, and we had to, as well, determine the range of activity of antimicrobial activity. So the first screen, we did it in Colombia. We got strains from everywhere, so bacterial type strains and other strains from the strain bank in Bogota. And we did an activity antagonism test, antimicrobial test, against 16 bacterial species, 23 strains of them. Uh, then, second step, we check antifungal activity. People were always saying, it might have antifungal activity and then it can be also interesting. So we check antifungal activity against uh, egg fungal pathogens. And then we check the best strain against a collection of phytopathogen strains that were here in, in Trieste. This has been done with the collaboration of Victoria's lab. And the, I know this table is very easy. I don't like to show tables, but what I want you to see here is that A20 and 5.1, these two isolates, have a broad range of action. So they are able to control a lot of these bacteria and all the fungal isolates that we tested. We have kept, always keep testing more and more that people send us, and we have seen that A20 is able to control many of them, and 5.1 as well. It's, it's a little bit less, but it's more intense, the control on, on many pathogens. So this is just to show you that, that this data is real. We have done this many, many times, and the reason why we repeat all the time this analysis is because there are differences in the antimicrobial compound production among batches of the same, of the same culture, the same bacteria. So here we have A20 in the corner here, and I want you to see how it's able to control many of this, um, of this bacteria. And this is the experiment that we do for antifungal activity. So we put a, a square here of the fungal, and, the, and we put a little bit of our actinobacteria here, and then we let them grow some eight or nine days, and then you see the sons of inhibition. And I want you to know that, for example, we have a strain that a very virulent strain of uh, Fusarium in Colombia, and all our actinobacteria are able to control the Fusarium strain. That is a strong pathogen of clover. So we are very hopeful that these inoculants could also maybe be used for those crops. And these are results from the, the work in Victoria's lab. So a student of mine came here in January and February. She's Diana Vergara. I know some of you met her. And she tested uh, the activity against all these pathogens that are phytopathogens. And they are pathogens, strong and virulent strains uh, that attack all these crops. And we were happy to see that we got antagonism against these strains as well. So now, next step, well, we have to try to study the antimicrobial compounds that are produced. This is also a requirement from the, from the regulatory entity. They, if we come out with a product, they want to know which is the mechanism that your uh, agent is using to control. So I had never done this. So I got together with people who knew more or less, and this was also a strong input from Vittorio's lab, Giuliano de Gracia and Corrado Guarnacha. So I first think, OK, are the metabolites secreted? And this was important because then people could say, you are providing antibiotics to the soil. And this is not what we're doing, because as you will see, the bacteria have an interaction with the plant that is what generates maybe the control on the plant growth promotion. If these metabolites are secreted, which is the solubility profile? And this might be interesting from the scientific point of view. We are scientists, we want to know. But this is important for the people in the company because if you have, you're producing compounds that are not soluble in water, then the rainwater won't be able to take them to the plant. And then they will need a special mechanism to get in touch with the plant or with other bacteria. 
So the solubility profile is important in those terms. How can we separate them? Big thing, because if we can separate them, we can purify them, and then we can assess which is the structure. Um, can we use solubility, charge, size? What can we do? How can I produce a lot of them? This is a $1 million question. This is a big thing because we have to improve and optimize the conditions in the fermenter, and it requires a lot of people to check which is the best condition that allow me to produce a lot of antimicrobial compounds. And it, what's the, the basic structure? So to do that, to elucidate the, compound, uh, uh, the compounds, we first started by performing a bioassay guided fractionation with increasing polarity solvents. So I, um, I was able to grow this strain, A20, that was the one I chose to work it with, um, in a reactor of 80 liters. You know, it's fun, just grow 500 milliliters of, of your bacteria and then provide it to the reactor and monitor all the conditions. And when five days have gone, then you can come out and, 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 and uh, take a little bit, a little bit, 200 or one, one liter, and then perform experiments with that. We did this many times, at least six times. So we took the cells and washed them, and we took the Spencer Bernadine and filtrated, so to remove the cells. Then we perform a lethyl acetate extraction, one to one, and then we get an organic phase and an aqueous phase. Save that and see, then check antimicrobial activity. Then we did an extraction with butanol, and you'll say why this? Because, because at this point, if you follow here, number four, uh, maybe this one is not that clear, but in Fusco it's very nice. So this is the sample, the starting sample. Then I have one and two, and you see nothing is there in one. There is no antimicrobial activity, but in two there is antimicrobial activity, which means the antimicrobial compounds are there residing in the in the supernatant. Then I fractionate with ethyl acetate, and we have fraction four, that is the organic phase. You see, no activity at all. But in fraction three, that is this one, the activity remains. So it tells us that the antimicrobial compounds have gone to that fraction. And then we perform a uh, butanol extraction. So we are going to partition this in charge and not charge polar compounds. We have the butanol phase, that is number six, is here, it's not having acti antimicrobial activity, but fraction number five, it is. And I, I'm sorry that it's not that clear here, but we had the same results for both pathogens. So what we know from there is that the molecules that are having antimicrobial activity produced by this, by this isolate are most likely charged and hydrophilic. What do I do with that? So first result. Okay, let's check the most abundant compounds are antimicrobial compounds. So a quick way to check that, and this was a victorious idea, is check the susceptibility to pronase or lysozyme and see if the activity disappears when you put them in touch with one of those enzymes, then you're having maybe a peptide or something. We did that, and it didn't work. We didn't see changes in the activity when we provided pronase. So you see, the activity is the same. So okay, it's not a peptide, most likely. So go on. So then we did ultrafiltration studies, and we saw that um, uh, when we use amicon filters, washing them and all the stuff, the activity always remains in the fraction that is shorter than 3 kD. So these are very small compounds. We actually used 1 kD amicon filter, and we saw that they were even shorter than 1, that 1 kD. So they are very small. That reduces the amount of compounds that they can be. Now we have a, a, a database that is called streptomdb, in which you can say, okay, I want to see the compounds that are smaller than one, one kd, and still there are thousands. So it was helpful, but not enough. So this was a purification strategy that uh, was proposed by Giuliano and Corrado, and so it was based on the knowledge we had. We know that it's a charged compound, so why don't we do an ion exchange chromatography and cation exchange chromatography? and it has to be retained in one of those, and then we do something else. So what we did at the end was to do an ion exchange chromatography. If it's an anionic compound, it will be retained here. If it's not, then it will go. Then we do cation exchange chromatography, and if it's retained here, if it was not here, it has to be retained here. And then we have to invent something or figure out an, an, a strategy to purify from there, the fractions that come out from here. We have ion pairing chromatography, fractions that are clean, crystalline pure from here, can go to mass spectrometry, 
and maybe from there we can do NMR or something else. So this is a slide that Diana prepares, and I love it because it really shows how we get fractions. We get not 30 or 20, we get hundreds of fractions, and then we go and perform with all those fractions antimicrobial analysis. And we choose those fractions in which the activity remains. So in the anion exchange chromatography, nothing was retained. But when we went to the cation exchange chromatography, we had fractions, clean fractions. So from then, we performed uh, ion pair chromatography. We got very clean fractions. And from there, we went to the mass spec. That is this. So I don't want to go into the details here. But when we saw that, we did the mass spec. And we analyzed the masses that were the mass C ratio that came out from the mass spec analysis. We went to streptome DB, and we found compounds that had exactly the same mass, three compounds, three of them. When we check the, the mass spectrometer uh, um, profiles, we also saw that the profile was identical to something that had been reported 50 years ago. Well, they didn't have the mass spectrometry as, as we not have it now, but then the, the profiles that were reported in the references were identical. And we noticed that these compounds were produced by similar strains to ours called streptomyces racemochromogenes, known as streptotricins. When I was telling this to scientists, they said, oh, this is not a new compound. I don't care if it's not a new compound. I'm in interested in the activity when I provide it to the soil. And I'm interested in having a strain that is isolated by my group, isolated from rice soils in Colombia. So these compounds are known, and they are known to be antifungal and antibacterial compounds. And they were actually, as I will show you later, these are the, the masses that we that came out. They have been reported and very nicely studied. Actually, there is a product, a, a product and they're patenting now for the use in, uh, in plantain and banana in Spain. So definitely people have uh, been thinking about using bacteria producing these compounds for biocontrol. So we are, we are doing it as well. So streptotricins are wide spectrum anti antimicrobials, very small, hydrophilic, as you know. So they are uh, suitable for use in, in agriculture. So this is why we are going on with them. So after that, I was happy. At least I know this bacteria is able to produce at least these three compounds. Now we know that it, it's able to, to produce many more metabolites, and most likely it's producing other types of streptotricins, because you find papers in which there is a report that uh, these bacteria don't produce not one or two, but produce six or seven. The thing is that we were able to detect three, and that's good enough for us. We know that it's convenient, because if it produces only one compound, then the possibility of, uh, of resistance is quick, and then the product won't be useful anymore. But now that we know that there are several of them, we are hopeful that it's, very, it's, a, good, uh, it's a good candidate. So now we go to see what, which are the effects on the plant. So when I got these strains, I, I was always thinking, what happens when we provide these strains to the field, to the plant? I have to make sure and, and ensure to the people in the regulatory institutions that is not going to be pathogenic or is not going to be deleterious for the plant. So we talked about performing plant growth promoting analysis. So we talked about the activities, the traits that confer this plant growth promotion. So one of those is increased nutrient availability. For example, if we put a lot of phosphate, if the bacteria is able to produce phosphatases that then make available the phosphate to the plant. Or if it produces extracellular enzymes, and why is this important? Because it helps for the colonization of the bacteria. Bacteria that produce extracellular enzymes are able, for example, to degrade the cell wall and get into the plant. So that could be convenient. Some of them are able to produce endolacetic acid, and this substance reduces the stress in the plant. So the plants grow happier and grow more and are more productive. And cider offer production, because this is a cider offer, are molecules that catch iron, you know, they sequester iron, and that could be convenient for as a biocontrol approach. So um, and a student of mine, Diana Vinchira, has been working one year and a half in all these experiments. This is a busy slide, but I want to tell you here is that she performed inoculation experiments. This is our negative control. In red, you have the length. In blue, you have the weight of the plant after you inoculate. It's one Oops, I'm sorry. After you um, provide the bacteria to sterile seeds. Why this? Why the sterile? And why don't we put the bacteria right in the soil? Because we want to know that the plant growth promotion is due to the inoculation of the bacteria. And this is something that needs to be proved. It's a canonical experiment always. 
So we have the in an non-inoculated treatment here. This is Asospirillum brasiliense that is known to be a plant growth promoter, our positive control, Acetobacter crococum. So you see they do, ha they, do, they do promote the growth because you have length and weight that is higher in the inoculated plants with the positive controls. And here are A20 in different concentrations. So we saw that when we provide this bacteria to the plant, we have increases in the, in the weight and in the length while these others are much less strong in, in, in the plant growth promotion. We also check the endolacetic acid production. It's quite low. This is uh, Asospirillum brasiliense. You see, I mean, a lot of endolacetic acid is produced. Here is very little, but this, this is common in streptomyces, so I was not that discouraged. This is the enzymatic activity. This is the cider offer test. So we use a classical way ap approach to see the sequestration of, of iron. And this is our control, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and these are our three actinobacteria. And you see, they get to switch the color from, from blue to yellow. These are uh, cellulolytic activities, and one of them has a lot of cellulolytic activity. And this is interesting because then it could be useful not only for biocontrol, but it could be useful also to degrade the cellulose that is the remaining post-harvest. And we check, and also this strain, that is the one that produces also cellulolytic activity, is able to solubilize phosphate. So it's, we have a, a batch of strains that have different uh, plant growth promoting associated traits. And this is our last experiment. I was always told here that, you know, bacteria can have, the plant can decide to recruit or not a plant growth promoting agent. So, it's not that because I provide the, the bacteria to the soil or to the plant, the, the plant is going to take it happily. It can prefer one or the other. So to check that, what we did was to try to test two different cultivars, F733, that is a, a, a more tolerant uh, cultivar against Burkholderia, and F, F, F60, that is Federal 60, that is a, a cultivar that produces a lot of rice, but is quite susceptible to the attack of Burkholderia. So here we have an inoculated control. Uh, here, this is again a positive control, Acetobacter crococum, and I want you to see how these biometric properties, the root fresh weight and the, shoot, the plant shoot fresh weight and the, sh the, the length of the plant shoot is higher, where you see an asterisk is because it's higher compared to the control, where I am inoculated with A20. You see, the biometric properties are higher wherever I inoculated with A20. So A20 is also promoting the plant growth. So it's definitely a candidate for an inoculant and a biocontrol agent. We are more interested in selling it because of the biocontrol than because of the plant growth promotion, but this at least shows that there are no deleterious effects related to the inoculation. Now, we are, we are answering right now, these two weeks I've not been at home, we are uh, performing experiments to verify that it's not, it, if it goes to the rhizosphere or if it's able to colonize endophytically. This is a tough experiment because not many streptomyces have shown to be endophytic colonizers, but it will be very interesting if it is. Uh, we are performing as well some microscopy, electron microscopy analysis to verify that in Colombia. And at this point, we know that this strain, we have one strain that produces these compounds that are active in a, wi a wide range of fungal pathogens and have al as well plant growth promotion properties. We know, and I, I can show you the figures here, but we have gone through an optimization process in, in, the, in the plant. So we are producing 1,000 liters and improving and checking the amount of, com of compounds that we are able to produce. And there is a whole team working in that. It's very complex situation because streptomyces can be as well temperamental. So we have to fit the best conditions to get production and growth. So what are we going to provide? A, comp a, a product that has a lot of antimicrobials and bacteria or we want to provide a lot of bacteria then go to the soil and make the work. And there are many questions emerging here. So for example, I'm a bacterial geneticist, I think. So what I want is to verify which are the genetic mechanisms that are involved there, you know, because if I can improve the bacteria somehow, I can be get a better production. The point is that in Colombia, we are not allowed to put genetically modified bacteria in the soil. But still, it will be interesting to know how can I regulate this. 
And a, a paper came out at the beginning of this year showing the complete operon responsible of the, of the production of streptotrysin, so it's, that's helpful. I have just to find out if the genes are organized in the same way in my streptomyces. Um, and I want to know how do they perform in plant? I, like, if I provide the bacteria to the soil, when can I get the best expression of the streptotrysins or the traits involved in the plant growth promotion? So that is a big story. I hope to make my life with this project. Let's see. What happens when I apply them to the soil? What happens, what is best? Apply them to the seeds? Apply, apply them in the flowering state? Applying two, three times? This is a cost, a beneficial analysis that I have to do, but I have to think as well that the farmer would like to apply it only once, not twice, because it's very expensive. I came to the people, to, the, to my boss, and said, listen, we can apply every month. And she said, no way. Then it, the cost is three times higher. So now, in spite of the fact that I love science, I have to think as well about money. So this is, a, this is a perspective. This is the class that I was talking about that came out in this paper, very nice. So we know that there, there are um, several genes and operon regulating the production of streptotrysins, but the, the conservation is not well understood. So I'm checking the generated primers to see if I can find out something about the genes uh, present there. Uh, we are currently performing, with one year and a half, that we are performing biocontrol experiments in the field. I can't show you now the results because we have to triplicate everything. So we have gone from January 2012, we performed the first biocontrol experiment, then the second semester we performed the, the second, and now we are performing the third. So very soon, we will have results from the biocontrol experiments. So far, we have seen that there is an important trend in biocontrol. So we are getting high yields again, even though we don't reduce the incidence. In other cases, in different places, we are getting biocontrol and increasing the yield. So it's showing very, very good, but still we have to wait for having a complete set of data to, to be able to show it. And we are also trying to follow what happens when we provide this bacteria to the soil, because it's a recurrent question. Everybody asks me, oh, but you're providing a producer of antimicrobials to the soil. So what is going to happen to the bacteria that are, they are there? So this has to be follow up. It's an important issue. We don't want to cause damages to the, to the environment. So we have to follow up what happens to the microbial communities residing there. And with this, I just want to thank me, my team. I'm just a piece of the whole organization. This is my group, this is, she's my boss, she's a biochemical engineer and is expert in growing bacteria and this is why we team up so well because I do bacterial genetics and all this funny stuff. And these are all my students, well, several of them. This is the, the owner of the company and they are the, the uh, crop science scientist. Uh, and this is my beloved uh, bacteriology group who's always supported me. This is not the best group of the Institute is the best group of the world, I want to say. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, from the National University of Colombia. They have helped me a lot to understand the mass spec. You know, all these results come out and uh, I just don't know where to put my head. And Fede Arroz, because he's always been very supportive and helpful to, pro to perform the experiments in the field, which I hope to show very soon. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you.